want to follow up on what Pastor Talk and uh, Bayless were talking about yesterday of the church going into the world. Sometimes it's pretty scary because we're in the last chapter. How many of you know that? Yeah, I don't know what part of the last chapter we're in, but we're in the last chapter somewhere. And God has called us to reach a last chapter world. And you know as well as I, it's not getting better, it's getting worse. Now you can see it in one of two ways. You can see it as, oh, throw your hands up, we're done. It's getting worse. There's no hope. You can see it in that way, or you can say, no. You know, the reason it's getting pretty bad is because it's becoming far more evident that people need God. Yeah. It wasn't as evident before. It's very evident now that we need churches more than we've ever needed churches yeah, in the past. Right. Yeah. Look around how evident it is that people need God. They're falling away from God. So you can either throw your hands up and say, well, it's no use. Or you can say, no, it's so evident that the church is so desperately needed more now than ever before. See, Matthew 6, says it in this way. The lamp of the body is the eye. And if your eye is clear, your whole body will be filled with light. If your eye is bad, your whole body will be filled with darkness. And if that light that is in you is darkness, how great shall that darkness be? Now, when the Bible says the lamp of your body is your eye, it's not talking about your eyeball. It's talking about the way you see things. See, you really don't see with your eye. That's just a lens. You actually see with your mind. Think about it. This is just a lens. You see with your mind. It's how you think about things that makes all the difference in the world. Right. I need to say this. I want you to listen very carefully. Ready? Mankind can rise above virtually anything. A setback, a major accident, a problem, financial collapse... Mankind can rise pretty much above anything he ever faces. Just an amazing human being. However, there's one thing you will never be able to rise above. Ready? It's the quality of your thinking. If you want to have a great future, you've got to think differently. Because you see, that's what sees, not your eyeball. It's your mind. And if you say, it's no hope, this world is going down in a spiral, and if that's how you see it, you will become a victim to that. On the other hand, you say, oh, no, no. This tells me that my neighborhood needs Jesus more than it's ever needed Jesus before. How important the church is now more than ever. You see the difference? <laughs> Stories told about two salesmen. They're shoe salesmen. They went to uh, Africa and uh, they got, get off the plane and they look around and nobody's wearing shoes. They thought, well, wait a minute, we're shoe salesmen. No one's wearing shoes. One guy runs to the f phone area and, and dials up his company and says, cancel all my orders. Nobody uses shoes here. The other one runs to the phone, calls the, up his company, triple my order. Everybody needs shoes here. That's the way you see and we're the last chapter here. So I want to talk about how important it is to see. How important it is to see correctly. Now, I'm going to do something here. It's kind of interesting. But if I said to you, there's a light here. And you say, no, there's not. There's no light. Sure there is. No, there's not. There's a light. No. But if I did this, there is a light. Can you see that? Is there a light? No, there's no light. Is there a light? Yeah, there's a light. Well, oh, I don't see the light. Oh, no, no, there it is. It's right there. You see, here's the thing. You can have light, but you can't see it if there's no reflective surface. I was talking to an astronomer, and, and I said to him, you know, what's the black hole in space? He said, well, it's a place where there's no planets. I said, it's really dark there. It's pitch black, isn't it? He said, oh, no, there's light there. I said, no, 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 that's called a black hole because there's no light. He says, oh, and there's much, as much light there as any place else in space. I said, no, I know you're an astronomer, but I don't think there's light there because it's dark. He said, no, there is light. I said, then why is it so dark? He said, because there's no planets there, and the reason you can see light is because there's a reflective surface. 
if you remove the reflective surface, the light goes into space, but you don't see it. Is there light? Absolutely. But you don't see it until there is a reflective surface, and then you see it. No light, light. No light, light. Is there light? Yes, even in the darkest time on this earth, the light of Jesus is shining today as brightly as it did in the book of Acts. The miracles of God are as available today as ever before. Then why don't we see it? Because he's waiting for reflective surfaces. And the more of us become reflective surfaces by cleaning our lives up so that we polish our surface, his light begins to reflect and refract all over the world. I want to talk about us and how to see things because it's so important in how we reach people. So we're going to talk about that, and I'm going to just entitle my message, Everybody is Waiting for Jesus. We're going to take a look at Luke 8 and verse 40, and it's going to come up on the scripture, and I'm going to ask us to read it together out loud. So <clears throat> get out your most Shakespearean thespian voices, and let's speak it out nice and loud, men, with your basal profundo, please. All right, here we go. Go. And as Jesus returned, the people welcomed him, for they had all been, for they had all been. Here's a way that I want to encourage you to see the world, and it'll make a huge difference. Everyone is waiting for Jesus. Everybody needs a touch. They're waiting for Jesus. No, 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 no. They're not waiting for the church. They're not waiting for religion. They're not waiting for someone to tell them how bad they are and how sinful they are. They are waiting for whom? Jesus. For Jesus, for a genuine touch from God. You see, everybody needs God, whether they show it or not. In fact, most people, due to pride or embarrassment, will not show it. But everybody has a silent need. Everybody in this room probably has a hidden hurt. Maybe you're nursing a medical condition. Maybe you're still wounded from a broken dream. Or you have a, you're sort of fearful because of a financial situation. But we can't see it. But everybody needs Jesus because we're, we're all waiting for God to do something. Everybody. And they welcomed him because everyone was... Let me tell you a few stories. I was golfing some time ago and... Um, I was going to my ball when a golf cart came whipping towards me. And uh, I slowed down, and this guy jumps out of his golf cart, and he looks around, and he says, I'm a Buddhist. I said, okay, hello. Hello, he said, uh, I'm a Buddhist, but I've been watching you on TV. <laughs> Every week. I said, oh, that's wonderful. He said, yeah, so just want to let you know. Thank you. And he got in his car and took off. <laughs> and I thought, everybody's waiting for Jesus. Yeah, True story. I go back to the golf uh, club, and the golf pro comes out from behind the counter, and he says, uh, Pastor, uh, could I talk with you for a second? I said, sure. He said, could we go around the corner? Oh, okay. So I walk around. He goes outside of the golf club, and he says, my mother and I haven't been speaking to each other for five years. It's breaking my heart. He says, Christmas is coming up. I just got to talk to her because she's getting older. But we've had an estranged relationship for five years. I haven't said a word to her nor she to me. I really want to bring her to a church. I'm not a Christian, but I know if there's a God, I need his help. I said, I will. I'll pray for you. And I, I said, let's pray right now. And I laid hands on him, and we prayed. And when it was done, he said, okay, thank you. And he ran back into the golf <laughs> club. You know, two Sundays later, he comes to church with his mom. Wow. Wow. And I thought, everybody's waiting for Jesus. Yeah. A week later, I was in a restaurant, and this waitress comes bulleting across the restaurant, she slides into the booth across from me. She says, I just need to let you know, I went to your Easter service. I said, oh, wonderful. She said, and you know when you prayed about people getting healed? I said, yes. She said, I had a very, very painful back injury, and all of a sudden God touched it, and it was gone. Wow. 
I said, wow. She said, I didn't tell you, thank you, but I wanted to tell you today. I said, wonderful. She said, but I got another problem. <laughs> I said, sure, what's that? She said, the police found my mother last week dead in the car in our garage. I said, oh, I'm so sorry. She said, I just don't know what to do. I said, can we pray? She said, please. Stretched her hands across the table. I grabbed a hold of her. After I prayed for her, gave her a big hug, and as she left, I thought, everybody's waiting for Jesus. You can't see it, but everybody's waiting for Jesus. You can go to a coffee shop, and you can have a non-Christian over there, and if you'll go with a sincere heart now, I bet you could go over there and ask God for a word. Even if he's a non-Christian, you could say to that person, excuse me, sir, <clears throat> God just prompted me to let you know that he hears your prayers and you're very special to him. Just, just wanted to pass that message to you. You go away, he will think about that all week because something in his heart resonates. Why? Because everybody's waiting for Jesus. Well, they might react negatively at first. Get out of here, you Jesus freak. But when you go away... That word will start to germinate because Isaiah 55, 11 says, yeah. my word will not go forth from me void, but it will accomplish what I have sent it forth to accomplish. Just give that to them. And their lives will be transformed. Why? Because everybody is waiting for Jesus. You have to see it that way. You just got to see it. You say, well, Wayne, how, how do you do that to just... That the church can be the church? Yes. Do you have to be a Billy Graham? No. Do you have to be an evangelist or a prophet? No. Well, what do you need to be? I'm going to give you three door openers. Are you ready? Here it is. I'm going to give it to you first, and I'll explain them. Be kind, be willing, and be Jesus. Be kind, be willing, be Jesus. Be kind. No, 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 don't be Billy Graham. Well, if I'm going to win someone to Christ, i got to be an evangelist. Nope. Well, i got to be a D.L. Moody. Nope. What, do you, what should I be? Be kind. Yeah. I often pray for non-Christians that they be saved, and I pray for Christians that we be kind. I have met the most unkind Christians. We just, we just don't have it down. we just got to be kind. Now, people might not go to your church because they don't want to believe in Christ, but may it never be that they don't go to your church because we have been unkind. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. You say, really? Absolutely. Did you know that the Lord says this in Romans 2 and verse 4? It is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. Yeah. Yeah. Ephesians says this. It says, be ye kind one to another and forgive one another even as God in Christ forgave you now listen to this John 15 says it's so good I used to call you slaves but now I call you friends you know why it's so important for us to be kind because you can't win your enemies to Christ you only win your friends see people won't go to your church if they don't even like you they got to at least like you. So we've got to develop a heart of kindness. No, it doesn't mean you endorse what they're doing. No, no, no. Jesus was kind to the prostitutes, the money lenders, the sinners and publicans, weren't, wasn't he? Yeah, he didn't endorse what they were doing, but they even called him friend. He was a friend to the sinners. Because you can't win your enemies. You only win your friends. Brilliant, brilliant. And so God is speaking to us to just be kind. You see, people are at the top of God's list. You agree? Yeah. And if I want to be a person after God's heart, then people have to be at the top of my list. Wow. That's how it is. Wow. You start with not being an evangelist. You start with just being kind. <laughs> I have a two lists I often take down in my life. One is a to-do list. How many of you have to-do lists, yeah, yeah. But I also have another list, and it's a to-be list. I have a to-do list, and I, I want to finish them off, 
But I have a to be list. Well, what's that? Well, there's things that when God reveals to me that I need to become, I write that down. Example, several months ago, I was at church and a lady came to me and she has a tendency to talk, 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 talk. And, and so, so um, I was talking with her, trying to be pastoral, but I was, yes, yes, mm -hmm, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh. Yes, God bless you. You want to, yeah, yeah, Joe Blow will pray with you. You bet, yeah, hi, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh. And so I put her off and then went to someone else, and just then God said, you could have spent at least 30 seconds more with her. She just needed someone to love her. Just someone to tell her she's valuable. It would have taken you 30 seconds. And then this is what God said. Learn to take 30 more seconds. Wow. That's it. 30 seconds. I wrote that down and I put it into my life 30 seconds more. Just 30 seconds more. Right. I don't know if you tasted Angela's uh, fr friatas, what do you call those? Fritatas, uh, frijoles, uh, whatever it is, but... <laughs> I just had some in the cafe back there. It's amazingly good. So I ate it and I thought, man, that's good. And I was running off here to get to the auditorium when the Lord said, 30 seconds. Uh -huh. So I made my way back into the kitchen, went into the kitchen, Angela. She was, had her head in the oven and she said, yes. I said, those were the best little frittatas or frijoles, whatever. That was the best muffins I've ever had. Really, and her face brightened up. And so we talked for a little bit, gave her a big hug, and then came in. The Lord said, 30 seconds. It's me. It means more than you will ever realize. That's how you make friends. Understand? That starts with people around you. It starts with people in the world. Just be kind. Just be kind. We haven't learned that yet. But Jesus said, I call you friends. I want to tell you about a friend of mine, and his name is Michael. He, he's older, and uh, he, he has a halting, haltering speech. It's stuttered a little bit. I think it's the beginnings of, of uh, Parkinson's. But we were at a restaurant. He loves God, and he's the sweetest man, probably about 75 or so, and, and, uh, but the biggest heart. So we were having dinner. My wife was next to me. His wife was over here. And the waitress came and she said, may I take your order? And so she took our order and uh, he said, uh, looked at her and said, do you work here a lot? She said, oh, this is just my part-time job. She said, I'm, I'm at going to school trying to be a nurse. He said, is that your dream? She said, yes, it really is. He said, you will make a great nurse. She said, really, you think so? He said, I know so. Can I pray for you? And I'm thinking, this is the middle of the restaurant, Michael. Knock it off. <laughs> he said, could I pray for you that God bring that to pass because he would love to? She said, would you? He said, I would. He grabbed her hands and prayed the most beautiful prayer. And when I opened my eyes, she was just crying. A few more words and she left, wiping her eyes. And I thought, everybody's waiting for Jesus. Just you didn't see it, Wayne. Michael did. And kindness opened the door. Do you understand? It's a door opener. That's what it is. It's a door opener. And the church needs to open doors so the people can come in. All our doors are closed for the most part. I think we need to open doors to the church. Can you say amen to that? Amen. We need to open a bunch of doors. And when I left that, that dinner, I thought, dear Jesus, would you make me more like him? Just help me to be kind. Just 30 seconds more would have changed a person's life. It did hers. Be kind. It's number one for opening doors. But not only be kind, because we will never be proficient, you know, at evangelism stuff or being saints of God or being the best Christian. We, we won't. We won't. We'll never have achieved that high level. Won't. We're all on the way. We're all imperfect people serving a perfect God. Can you say amen to that? And we'll be perf imperfect for a long time. But if we could just be, here's a second, 
Not only be kind, be willing. If we'll just be willing, Jesus will take over. See, if you're not willing, he's not, he doesn't step in. But if, if you're willing, if you're willing, Jesus takes over. Now, a lot of times we're not even willing because we're afraid of embarrassment. We might fail. We might make a mistake. We might be rejected. Jesus says, just be willing. I'll take over the rest. Just, I need your heart. I just need your heart to be willing. Do you remember when Abraham took his son Isaac up to the mount and God said, sacrifice your son? He took that knife and he raised it up high. I'm sure tears streaming down his face. And when he brought that knife down to plunge it into his son, all of a sudden, bang, God said, good. That's it. What? Yep, yep. I don't need you to sacrifice your son. Why'd you ask me to do this? Because I just wanted, to, I wanted your heart. Because as soon as he brought that knife downward, something had to have changed in his heart to give up his son and make God preeminent again. Something happened in his heart. God said, whoop, that's it. That's all I need. I just need your heart. I don't need your son. <laughs> and he showed him a ram. A ram was exchanged. All I need is your heart. If you're willing. Will you be willing? That's all. Will you be willing? Yeah, but, but I might not. Will you be willing? Because I'll take care of all. Yeah, but I might. Fit, fit. No, no, no. Are you willing? I am. Good. I'll take care of the rest. You see, each of us is going to wrestle with that. Because if I pointed at Jeremiah, I'd say, Jeremiah, a third of you is unsaved. Sorry. A third of you talk is unsaved. A third of you, Sam, is unsaved. Graham, a third of you is unsaved. Because we have spirit, soul, and body. And John 17, 17 says this, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is not willing. And what makes all the difference in the world is that third of me, if it takes over the other two-thirds or even takes over one-third, I won't do it. Because the flesh is not willing. Spirit is, flesh is not. Question is, who are you going to listen to? Because you're always going to have that third of you pushing you to say no. All Jesus is asking is, would you be willing? Just would you be willing? His name is Ted Place. Ted was at a conference like this when the pastor said, would you be willing if God asked you to walk through an open door? Not whether or not you've got all the words down. He didn't ask you to pass out any big bunch of tracks. Just would you be willing to do whatever God asks you to do and just walk through the open door. Let him do the rest. And if you're willing, I want you to stand up. And, and he said, and I want you to give a gift to God of something. Uh, uh, let's say you cook. Would you be willing to give your culinary skills to God for his use and let him take care of the rest would you be willing to give your singing to God would you be willing to give your piano playing to God your ushering to God your willingness to serve a carpentry whatever it might be just let's all give gifts to God today just to let him know that you're willing so everyone stood up and and he said, okay, just do that. Go verbally and just give it to God. And he heard one lady say, I give you my piano playing. I give you my leadership. I give you this. I give you that. And Ted Play said, I didn't have anything. Except, he said, every Saturday I go to the park and I, for exercise, he said, I somersault. I know it's stupid. sounds dumb. But I just said, God, I, I give you my somersaulting. <laughs> well, I'm willing. I don't know how it's going to help heaven. But there you go. Well, the next Saturday, he went to the park, as he always did, because right before the uh, service was done, the pastor said this, now make sure that if God uses that willingness and opens a door, you will never say no. You must be willing. He said, okay. He was at the park, and he began somersaulting when uh, <clears throat> some junior high kid came over and said, hey, mister, that's pretty cool how you do that. Would you teach me? Ted said, uh, no. Yeah, I'll be willing. <laughs> I'll be willing. Under one condition. The kid said, what? 
The condition is after I teach you to somersault, you'll sit and listen so I can tell you about the one who taught me to somersault. Kid said, sure. Good, he said, I'm willing. So he somersaulted and the kid sat down and he told him about Jesus. The kid was so excited, he said, hey, mister, next week, can I bring a couple of friends? He said, mm, I'm willing. Well, the next week, several other kids came and he taught them how to somersault. And he said, under one condition, when I'm done, you listen to the one who taught me. Let me tell you about the one who taught me to somersault. After it was done, they said, hey, could we come back next Saturday? He said, yeah, I'm willing. After two months, there were 75 junior high kids coming every Saturday to hear about God. Well, the local mission heard about this man's ministry. <laughs> and the pastor of the mission said, hey, you know, all of the guys have to have a chapel before uh, they eat, so would you come to the chapel and speak? He said, mm, I'll be willing. <laughs> well, he didn't know how to speak. Well, he got up there the first morning, and before breakfast, he began to preach and tell them about the ministry that he had with junior high kids, and what the pastor didn't tell him was that every 15 minutes, the train would go by, and it would rumble so loudly that no one could hear what he said. And all the guys at the mission were saying, speak up, buddy, speak up. So every 15 minutes, Ted would have to raise his voice so that they would hear him above the train. Well, it was such a wonderful time. The pastor said, would you come back again next Sunday and teach? He said, I'll be willing. And he began to do that for three years. He was preaching at the mission. And every 15 minutes, he'd lift up his voice because there was no sound reinforcement. And he would speak the gospel of Jesus Christ until later, 15 years later, Ted Place was in Youth for Christ. And he was one of the very few people that could speak without a microphone to 3,000 kids as they heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Where did it start? Was he a D.L. Moody, a Billy Graham? No. He was willing. You see, be, be kind. Be willing. God will take over. Because the last is, because then you'll be Jesus. What? Yeah. Let me explain it this way. For a lot of people, you will be the only Bible they will ever read and you will be the only Jesus they will ever see. How are you doing? Think about it. You may be the only Bible they will ever read and you will be the only Jesus they will ever see. How are you doing? Maybe now we know why people aren't getting saved like they should. But if you understand the kindness of God that leadeth to repentance, and that you're just willing, because he'll take over at that moment, he'll take over, then all of a sudden they begin to see Jesus, not you. And you didn't have to try to be Jesus. He'll just use you. Let me finish with this. His name was Keith Miller, and, and uh, he was out of work. He lived near the urban center. Finally, he got a job after eight months of looking. He was in town. He had to drive his car to the subway station, leave the car there, get on the subway, go into town. Then they'd come back, get in his car, drive home. Every morning, he would pray with his wife, Oh, God. Let me somehow reflect you to people. Oh, he loved Jesus. Somehow, let me reflect you to people. I don't know how that will happen, but let me reflect you. Well, he had just gotten this new job, and, and things were going pretty good. But he was still on a probation, a three-month probation. When after about two and a half months, he got up a little later than he thought. So he's rushing downstairs. He grabbed his lunch that his wife always made for him in a little lunch box and 
And, and Ted was rushing out the door saying, I've got to get to the subway, honey. If I don't, I may lose my job. I'm on probation. She said, we haven't prayed yet. Oh, he said, oh, that's right, that's right. And he always prayed in the morning the same prayer. Oh, God, let me reflect you to someone today in Jesus' name. Amen. And he got in his car and went to the subway, got off the sub, uh, uh, off his, uh, car, out of his car, and he's, as he's running down the, the walk to, to catch the subway, he realized he was late because there was a boatload of people coming his way, having already disembarked from the subway that he was supposed to get on. And knowing if he missed the subway, he would get fired because he's on probation. So he's running through the crowd, kind of pushing them away. And when he turned the corner, bam, he smacked that, ran into a little kid, must have been in the fourth grade, Boom! And the little kid's lunch went everywhere. His papers went everywhere. His pencils went everywhere. Obviously, he was going to school. And, and the kid fell down. He picked him up and said, Sorry, kid, I got to get to work. And zipped over to the subway. And when he got his foot on the first rung of those stairs to get into the subway, God spoke to him and said, Didn't you pray this morning? Yeah, I did. Didn't you pray that somehow you would reflect me to people? Uh, yeah, I did. And in a nanosecond, which seemed like a suspended animation, God's speaking to him. Do you know that in a moment, God can speak to you a ream yeah. of stuff? God said, you can either get on the subway and leave that kid sprawled on the concrete and make it to work, or you can go back there and help that young man, and I'll take care of the rest. It's your choice. He then took his foot back off of the rung and went to find that little kid. And when he did, that little kid's face was smeared with dirt and tears. And he began to help him pick up his papers. Excuse me, sir, could I get that paper there? Oh, yeah, oh, let me get that pencil. Excuse me. He got all of his papers back together. Got his pencils. And then he took that little boy's paper bag that, that had been emptied because of the collision and his lunch had been stepped on and strewn all over the concrete. He opened that little boy's package and he opened his lunch box and he put his lunch in that little boy's bag and he turned the top of that package and he put it in the little boy's hands along with his papers and pencils and he looked at that little boy and said, you're going to have a good lunch today. I know. And then he looked that little boy in the face as he wiped his tears. And he said, never forget how much God loves you. And then when he left that little boy, he started walking towards where the next subway ramp would be so he'd catch the next subway when just a little little ways away when he heard the little boy say excuse me mister excuse me and Keith said I turned around I said yes the little boy looked up at me and said are you Jesus <laughs> and Keith said you know for a moment I think I was to him anyway Everybody's waiting for Jesus, not for religion. They're waiting for Jesus, not a track. They're waiting for Jesus. And, and if we would be kind and be willing, you just may be. Well, where do I start? Start with the people right around you. Just start right here. How's that? Mother Teresa was in an interview, and the interviewer said to her, What's your goal? She said, my goal is to win the world for Jesus. And the interviewer said, that's quite a tall order. Where do you start? She smiled and she said, I start with the face that Jesus puts in front of me. Start with the face that Jesus puts in front of you. And say something to them that Jesus would say to them. Be kind. Do something for them that Jesus would have done for them. Be willing. And if you do that, you just might change a life that Jesus wanted changed. Why? Because everybody 
is waiting for Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would help us to be the living church, the church that reflects your light. No, not ours. It really effectuates from you. But you're waiting for the reflective surfaces. But not, not surfaces that are soiled with self. People that are willing to just be kind. Be willing. So we can be Jesus to a needy world. Because everybody is waiting for Jesus. Amen.